I live in a small, rural town in southern Russia, and in the past year or so, a strange fervour has arisen here regarding the Flat Earth Theory. For the uninitiated, it's basically a theory which states that the Earth is a plane, or disc, as opposed to a sphere. Not a nonsense, of course, with so much of modern science disproving it. Or so I thought, until just a couple of months ago, when I was invited to one of these stupid conventions that have been popping up more and more frequently. Now, usually, I'd scoff at whoever would even believe in this, much less have the audacity to think I'm mentally impaired enough to want to attend one of their cult gatherings. But this time, it was different. Anastasia, the girl who invited me, was one of my closest friends, and someone whom I clicked with almost solemnly because she was one of the few rational people in this superstitious town. Heck, we were even in school science club together. One of our favourite pastimes used to be poking holes in the countless folklores we'd always heard growing up. Of course, I also had a crush on her, so forgive me for wanting to take a gander at this new obsession of hers. Hey Alex, wanna come with me to a flat earth convention tomorrow? Recently I've been attending and it's been really eye-opening. My initial thoughts were that she was being sarcastic, however the enthused manner in which she asked unsettled me. It wasn't enthusiastic in the sense that we're going to blow the whole lid on this stupid theory and make a laughing stock out of all these silly people. She really seemed to believe in it, so much so as to want to rope me in and share with me her experiences. Um, Anna, I know what you're thinking, but trust me, how long have you known me? You know I'd be the last person to buy into any of these kinds of things. Admittedly, her insistence had indeed piqued my interest, and it didn't take much more convincing for me to tag along. So, the next day, I found myself at this so-called convention. It wasn't what I was expecting at all. It was held at a ramshackle cottage near the outskirts of town. There were no registration tables to indicate your interest or leave your contact information, no brochures or anything of that sort. The only thing to indicate that we hadn't stumbled upon an old abandoned house was a piece of paper stapled next to the main doorway stating Flat Earth, a Paragodania sect. It was all very sketchy. I raised an eyebrow at Anna and she just waved me ahead. The interiors of the cottage were actually much better kept than I'd imagined. It wasn't modern or pristine by any means, but it was very tidy and surprisingly well lit with strong fluorescent lighting seemingly recently installed. Neatly stacked chairs littered the perimeter of the room and there were some stairs to the next level in the corner of the room. It appeared that most of the walls had been torn down to accommodate the one piece of furniture which had caught my eye the moment I had stepped in. In the centre of the room was a massive mahogany table upon which laid an equally massive map that was some kind of ellipse rather than a conventional rectangular shaped map. Closer inspection of the map revealed that it was probably some kind of world map, as there was tons of blue oceanic regions, but it wasn't of any world I was aware of. The centre of the map was just a black void, but there were four main islands of sorts, distributed roughly in the four main cardinal directions as indicated by a drawing of a compass in the top right of the table. What was most intriguing was that bordering the map was what appeared to be an impossibly colossal mountain range circling the entire world. Let's head up, they've probably already started. You've got to see this. Anna snapped me out of my reverie, and together we went up the stairs to the next floor. The second level of the cottage was much closer to what I imagined a cult to be like. There were no fluorescent lighting here. The whole floor was candlelit, with the scent of some kind of incense wafting through the air. At the far end of the room, hung up on the wall, was another weird circular map, a blown up of one of the islands, the western one. However, this map wasn't just flat and printed on paper. It seemed to be handcrafted out of wood, with certain sections higher than others, as if denoting hills and valleys. Candlelight bounced off the wood in unnatural ways. I could have sworn that the wood was producing its own ethereal glow. On the right side of the map, there were approximately 10 deep spherical notches of around the size of marbles. Most of them were empty, save for two notches, which each had a small black marble in them. 
a congregation of people were seated on stools, all facing the map, and they were all humming the same, monotonous low tone. They were all dressed normally, wearing t-shirts and jeans and shorts, nothing out of the ordinary. The bald man leading the congregation stood out in front, next to the map. Next to him stood someone I had recognised. Dimitri, one of my neighbours, and a well-known bully whom I went to school with. He stood with a bemused expression as the bald man whispered in his ear. The whole atmosphere was eerie to say the least, and my fight or flight instinct took hold as the hairs on my arms raised and I gripped Anna's arm. What happened next made me doubt everything I had ever known. As the humming petered off, Dimitri spoke. Okay, okay. So basically, you're telling me, if I hold one of these black balls and touch the map, I'll travel to this different world with a giant tree and seven meters tall people who travel around in carts? The bald man was unfazed by the sarcastic incredulity in Dimitri's voice, simply gesturing for him to go ahead, as if daring him to take up the challenge. With a snort, Dimitri stepped forward and grabbed one of the black marbles out of a notch. Immediately, his disposition shifted from smug confidence to uncertainty, but pride must have driven him on as he steeled his expression, gritted his teeth and placed his finger on the map. A pulse rippled through the room. It's difficult to describe, but the air itself seemed to ionize and turn red at the point of contact, and at once, all of my senses were assaulted. A sonic boom in my ears, a blinding red light, a metallic scent and taste, and this all-encompassing pressure squashing my being. As soon as I was beginning to perceive the effects though, they were gone, and I was just left with an odd sense of emptiness. Dimitri, on the other hand, had more than just a sense of it as he slumped into the arms of the bald man. Oh my god, Anna, they killed him! Anna was just grinning. Don't worry, they didn't. He'll be back before you know it. Right on cue, Dimitri jerked awake. His eyes were wide as saucers and his jaw hung agape. The congregation suddenly burst into excited murmuring as the bald man led Dimitri gingerly to an available seat. After sitting him down, the bald man glanced at us. Ah, you must be Alexei. Anastasia told us about you. You know, we have a saying here. The bigger the skeptic, the blinder the believer. You are going to be in for an experience of a lifetime. Oh, my name is Igor, by the way. I'm the lead of this small branch of the Flat Earther Society here. Come, come, make yourself comfortable. You seem to have witnessed one of our new members travelling. Don't worry, it'll all make sense. The congregation began to scatter, and small groups started to mingle, with a couple of people approaching Dimitri, probing him on what he saw. Igor led Anna and I into a small adjacent room, a pantry of sorts with a table and a few chairs, and gave us some crackers and warm milk. Once we were settled, he started to expound on everything he believed about this whole theory. I learned that what we commonly understand about the Flat Earth theory is one big misconception. Igor says that they do not believe that the world we live in is flat. They know it is spherical. However, when they speak of Earth, they are not referring to our Earth. Rather, our Earth is simply one of the islands or continents in the massive world map on the first level, and that map is in fact a map projection of our four-dimensional universe onto a two-dimensional plane, and what they believe is that that four-dimensional universe is in fact flat and finite and bounded by the grey mountains as depicted. Each island is a whole, three-dimensional world in and of itself, and to cross the ocean, we can't just ride off into the sunset with a boat. We would require a fourth-dimensional vessel, what he calls a Kakraratna, the black marbles. He spoke more of their beliefs, and also about how the wooden map artifact that we saw was just one of three discovered in a Tibetan mine and somehow found its way to our town. It was all very overwhelming, and frankly too much for me to take in all at once. Sensing my confusion, Igor offered instead to just show me. Needless to say, 
even with a sceptic in me. I was quite scared, seeing what had happened to Dimitri. Even if all the travelling and other stuff Igor mentioned was just some elaborate hoax, I'd seen Dimitri collapse with my own eyes, and there had to be some kind of real, psychological effect, if nothing else. I'll go with him. We have two Kakrantners, right? Anna piped in. We've never travelled with more than one person at a time, though. We don't know what could happen. Igor contemplated momentarily. But, I suppose, what's the worst that could happen, right? And with that, we were in the back room with a wooden map. They'd replaced the black marble which Dimitri had taken. Igor had once again gathered the congregation of people, and this time I was the one up in front of the map with Anna. As the humming died off, Anna nodded to me, and together, with hands linked, we each took one of the black marbles. A slight wave of nausea hit me, but was gone in an instant, replaced with an overwhelming calm and sense of tranquility and what I can only describe as knowledge. At that moment, I felt like I suddenly understood everything. I could see the fabric of our universe and knew that what we usually see around us is just the very surface of reality, of existence. I looked across the room and simultaneously saw not just the congregation of people, but a vast number of otherworldly vistas, all superimposed one on top of another. Anna was beaming wildly, and she was glowing brilliantly as well, the red light seemingly surging out from the marble she held in her hand. Igor had called an assistant from the congregation, presumably to catch us when we fall. Wrapping our hands around our respective marble, we extended our index fingers and touched the map at the same time. This time, there was no burst of light. I was vaguely aware of my body collapsing into Igor, yet I was still stood upright. My vision corrected, and all the multiple vistas resolved into one primarily reddish landscape. Anna and I found ourselves in the middle of a vast rolling plains of purplish vegetation and a red sky. We were on top of a hill, overlooking a wide valley and some mountain ranges in the distance. Very far off in the distance was a tree of impossible size. It seemed to be beyond the horizon, yet the size of the trunk spanned almost half the entire mountain range that we could see, and right below the clouds poked out the lower branches of it, covered with bluish leaves. I could not fathom how much higher the tree could be above the clouds. Down in the valley, there were a bunch of bullet carts, some in disrepair and abandoned others still attached to a pair of monstrous beasts resembling oxen. They were around four times the size of the bears we see from time to time outside our town, and the carts they were strapped to were similarly as huge, as if each cart could fit a small house. Laying around on the ground were humongous humanoid figures, around two times the length of a car, seemingly content to just make a bed out of the lush purple flora. Come on, let's take a closer look. Anna said as she grabbed my hand. I threw her a wary look. Don't worry, they can't see us. I've been here countless of times. As we headed down into the valley, Anna explained to me how time was different here and that usually a trip here lasts around an hour, though back in our world, it would just be an instant. When that hour was up, as long as we were holding the black marble, we would automatically be sent back to our bodies I clutched my marble tightly. Anna still had an otherworldly glow about her. Not as incandescent as previously, but still an obvious bluish aura. As we moved down, while we were making contact with the ground, there was a sense of lightness, as if we were gliding rather than walking across the surface. In fact, we were actually intangible to some extent, our feet phasing through the vegetation, barely causing them to sway and shudder. Anna began to look increasingly puzzled. What's wrong? I inquired. This hasn't happened before, previously. I had always moved through this grass without touching it, but now look. Anna kicked a purple shrub. Her foot still did phase through it, but the shrub appeared to be pulled along slightly by her foot as it was going through it, shuddering back into its original position once her foot completely lost contact with it. Being my first time here, I didn't know what was normal or not. Everything was already surreal to me, 
and I couldn't do much to assuage her fears. The feeling of lightness was slowly dissipated, and her feet were slowly but surely making contact with the plants around us. After close to an hour, we finally reached the bottom of the valley. Despite walking for such a long time, I was surprised that I only felt the mildest sense of fatigue. We sidled closer to the nearest bullock cart, an abandoned one with a broken wheel. It seemed to be much bigger up close. Just then, I felt a rumbling pass through me. Around half a kilometre away, one of a pair of oxen appeared to be looking straight at us and bellowing. It appeared to be resting with its legs folded beneath it. There was no actual sound, but every time the creature puffed up its lungs and released the air, a deep vibration rippled forth. Um, are you sure they can't see us, Anna? I'm pretty sure that thing is looking right at us. I don't know, Alex. Maybe it just senses something. I've been right up to their noses before, and they've never reacted to me. I'm sure it's nothing. Let's go see what's in this cart. The abandoned cart was tilted backwards and slightly towards the side of the broken wheel. We climbed onto one of the spokes and carefully made our way up the wheel and onto the edge of the cart. I realised when we reached the top that the odd bellowing had ceased replaced by an unnerving silence. I was helping Anna down into the cart, when at that moment, I threw a glance towards the oxen, and my blood ran cold. Anna, stop, look, we need to go, now! I shouted in panic, as I tugged violently on her arm, arresting her descent. Now, not only were both the oxen standing on all fours and staring at us, two humanoid figures had gotten off the floor and onto their feet, towering over everything in the vicinity, and they too were looking right at us. Anna grabbed my arm with both of hers and clambered up the cart. The cart started shaking as the humanoids and oxen made their way over to us, each of their footfall causing a mini earthquake. None of them seemed in any rush to reach us, but due to their sheer size, they were closing the distance rapidly. Quickly, but with measured steps, we made our way down the broken wheel, when we reached the terra firma, the oxen were already just 50 or so meters away. Immediately, I grabbed Anna's hand and broke into a wild sprint across the plains, away from the monstrous creatures. Suddenly, Anna came to an abrupt stop. What are you doing? We need to go. No, Alex. My marble. Just then, I remembered. While I had simply put my black marble into the pockets of my pants to free up my hands, Anna had set her marble on the ground before climbing up the wheel, as she was wearing jeans with fake pockets. In our mad rush, Anna had begun to collect her marble. She sprinted back to the base of the cart. Anna, turn back! There's no time! One of the oxen had already reached the base of the cart, and it was at that moment that the marble started emitting a bright blue light, attracting its attention. Anna was still a distance away when the animal, in his curiosity, prodded the marble with its hoof. Anna screamed. The sound had barely reached me when all of a sudden I felt myself being sucked up into the air, my vision blurring, and before I knew it, I was staring straight at the face of Igor. Since that day, two months ago, Anna has not stirred. I was distraught at having lost one of my best friends and begged Igor many times since then to send me back so that I could try find her and bring her back. Igor too was shaken by that experience and as seconds turned to minutes and into days, the Flat Earth Society disbanded and Igor, in his guilt, stashed away the wooden map intent on never letting anyone travel again. I have been at Anna's bedside every day at the hospital waiting and hoping even for just a flitter of an eyelid. Yet, it was nothing at all. At least, until this morning. Anna had suddenly opened her eyes as her heart rate plummeted to a steady 10 beats per minute, and she had turned to me, opening her mouth as if to speak. But all that came out was not any sound that could be heard, but a deep, guttural reverberation that struck me to my core. I left the room to immediately record this and post it online. It is my greatest hope that this can find someone who has heard of this artifact, 
or has some information on this other world. If there are suddenly an increase in fervent believers in the flat earth theory in your community, please let me know and help me bring Anna back.